It's an easy way to get clicks when the world's richest man challenges the ninth richest to a cage fight. It's actually win-win if the owner of Twitter and the founder of Facebook have us debating whether we're Team Musk or Team Zuckerberg instead of the outsized power the pair enjoy thanks to the concentration of popular, mostly unregulated, social media platforms in the hands of a few. Yes, we'll ask about Zuckerberg's Thursday launch of a microblogging site to rival Twitter and about the delayed rollout here in Europe, where the courts Tuesday struck a blow to parent company Meta's monetization of users' personal data. Can it be a global conversation if it's different rules in different parts? What sets threads, as it's called, apart from other attempts to dethrone Twitter? And more broadly, how to build better social media in an age where the pressure to perform and the ability to spread disinformation at the speed of light have upended the very essence of how we see ourselves as human beings. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at a clash of tech titans. Joining us, he's a global ethics lead on generative AI products at Meta, Hubert Etienne, also professor at the prestigious HEC Business School here in Paris. How are you? Hi, great, thank you. Uh, welcome back as well to uh, tech entrepreneur and internet governance analyst uh, Leila Morsh. Welcome back. Thank you so much for the invitation. And from Nashville, Tennessee, Jacob Nshangama, executive director of the Future of Free Speech a Project. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. The France 24 debate where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. The timing couldn't have been better for Meta launching their microblogging site the same week that Twitter got bogged down in a new snafu, what with the temporary limitation of messages users can read. James Mulholland has more. The countdown is on to the latest Twitter rival, Threads. Facebook owner Meta is expected to launch its new text-based conversation app on Thursday. It's to be linked to Instagram, which could give it a huge advantage with its hordes of users. I think Threads is going to pose a huge threat to Twitter uh, because it's coming from the Meta and Instagram family of apps. Instagram has 2 billion users compared to around 250 million uh, of Twitter, so it's about 10 times bigger already. The launch of Threads comes as Twitter CEO Elon Musk has pushed users to sign up for paid subscriptions with moves like limiting free users' views to just 1,000 tweets, around five minutes of scrolling per day. It's the latest in a string of moves that's driven people to join rival platforms such as Blue Sky and Mastodon. And this could be another headache for Musk. I think that the key for this for Meta will be that it gets as many people on as quickly as possible. It makes it as accessible as possible. It has content creators and content that appeals to a broad mainstream audience and that brands feel that it's a safe space for them to carry on maybe what they've been trying to do and what they've been able to do up until recently on Twitter. Threads is the latest in the rivalry between Meta boss Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, who recently agreed to fight each other in a cage match. Hubert uh, Etienne, uh, your, your thoughts on, uh, we're on the eve of this launch, is this going to knock Twitter off its perch? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'd like to say as a user, I'd like to say finally, also, because um, once again, as far as I'm concerned, because I mostly focus on AI ethics rather than these kind of products, but I think that there's a, definitely a need for these kind of products. We know all the issues Twitter had in the past, before Elon Musk and after Elon Musk, on content moderation. And today, if I want to express myself, for instance, on events that are happening today in France, like the past few days, uh, I don't think Instagram is the right place for that. I don't think LinkedIn is the right place for that. And the people of our generation don't really use Facebook anymore, I mean, less and less. So I think we do need Thank you. an alternative. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, Leila Morch, there's a need for an alternative for, to Twitter. We remember a few months back when, when Elon Musk uh, bought Twitter, there was all this call to go on Mastodon. How did that go? Well, for Mastodon, I mean, I won't comment. You can see how many people use that and how it's not anymore at the center of the discussion. Uh, to answer your first question, yeah, there is an absolute need for something else. Not because Twitter is good, but just because we need diversity. If we need to have democratic space where people can express themselves, if we have only one 
then by design, it's an issue. By design, if you have to accept those kind of rules in order to speak to the community and engage in public and digital debate, having only one main platform um, where the kind of like winner takes it all race, uh, it's absolutely a no-go. But you um, want something that's a town square, right? Where you can, where that, people that who don't race. agree with you will, will, will. That's where I'm going. I'm, go. I'm not sure thread is uh, the thing we need. Um, I do believe we need something else. We need multiple other options, but I don't think something launched by another big company with maybe, you know, some issues we, we're going to discuss and, and we already discussed in the past is the best candidate to provide this public space. On the other hand, who could provide that and who's willing to go to the long way and super hard of designing a new platform, a new public space with all the huge challenges they're going to have to face from content moderation to where do they stop or where do they push the free speech and what can we see and, and, and have on that and how to engage with the legislator. So it's super, it's a super hard thing to do, but I'm not sure Thread is a good answer to that. But you seem to be su suggesting that the, the, the only ones who have that kind of know-how are the likes of Meta. Well, in a way, yes, because legislator and the society and themselves organize the way, the, the world in a way that they are the only one because they have so much power, financial power, uh, so much lobby in the different institutions. All the other actors are too small and the society as well as public services are not pushing for them to grow. So in a way they are in winner-take-it-all race and they are super, super far behind and they are the only one having this power because there is no counterbalance uh, that could that could raise. And I can, I can, and maybe we'll talk about that a bit later, but I'm, I'm working with a new social media emerging, trying to build something completely different with a new governance, a new business model. But they have a hard time growing because to find funding and to find help and to find support for the legislature when you are small in the social media space, it's super complicated. And this is what we should be working on instead of just complaining. Uh, Jacob uh, Nshimgama, uh, the France 24 debate is on Twitter. Uh, we like the fact that we are trying to reach out to people who have differing points of views. Who best to uh, host and moderate uh, the, 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 that town square discussion that we're all searching for? I very much ag agree that we need um, a more decentralized space in, in many ways. So, so you don't want um, three or four big uh, companies to um, act as de facto gatekeepers of, of global debate. So I think um, it's a good thing to have um, more decentralization. And of course, coming out of Meta, that, that, that might not be exactly what they have in mind, though I understand that that might be the idea that you could actually um, that the threats uh, can sort of be linked to, to the Fediverse. So you might actually be able to to link to your other uh, accounts, Mastodon, for instance, and migrate uh, your accounts if you don't like threats or if you're you're kicked off. If that is the case, then that's a, a change in model that 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 lowers some barriers uh, because it's one thing for you to be unhappy with Twitter or Facebook, but if all your friends and and and, and your entire network uh, users, fans, or whatever are, are on those platforms, it's a big jump to to move somewhere else. Um, if you can't convince everyone uh, else. Um, so, so if, if those features are built in, I think that's a step forward from um, a, a, a big company uh, like Meta. But I, at, at the end of the day, of course, it all depends on, you know, the, uh, the, the design, uh, how it will work uh, in practice. It's very easy to have great ideals, you know, um, Elon Musk was, some, was someone who had built some very successful cutting edge uh, companies in a number of different uh, industries. Uh, but I think everyone will agree that his rollout of Twitter has not been the success uh, yet, at least, uh, that, uh, that he had aimed for and that the way that, he, that he's running it now is, is, is deeply frustrating to, uh, to most users and doesn't even and doesn't even live up to his own sort of initial rhetoric about um, protecting free speech. Yeah, well, what do you make of, of this, 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 just very briefly, what do you make of this weekend uh, limitation on the, the number of tweets you can send out or read, excuse me, uh, on the part of Twitter? What, what, what's that about? 
Yeah, uh, well, I, I I don't have the uh, the the answer. Unfortunately, they don't invite me to to uh, to Twitter's uh, board meetings. Um, but um, but but it it's just a long line of, of of problems and issues, and also just a lot of very sub, sort of subjective, arbitrary seeming dis decisions that seem to come from Elon Musk himself. And some of them sort of one day you know throwing off journalists, another day sort of banning. Uh, Substack's uh, ability to uh, to 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 link because he, he sees Substack as a as a potential future threat, then you know uh, complying with orders from the Turkish government uh, to to uh, to remove uh, accounts of, of um, accounts critical of, of President Erdogan 48 hours before presidential election, uh, and so on and so on. And that I think uh, so the product. Is not as good uh, as as it was uh, before, and um, the 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 line the, coming out of the company from Musk himself just seems to be very arbitrary, and you don't know what to expect, which uh, uh, which is not a good sign uh, going forward. Uber so I think, Etienne, let me ask you on this: Is it any different at Meta? After all, Mark Zuckerberg has a, an overriding say uh, at the board. Can on a whim he decide um, that he's going to? put in new rules, uh, comply with governments that want to censor opposition uh, figures? So <clears throat> I would say, obviously, he's a CEO, so he's got the final word. But the, the way decisions are made is quite decentralized also. So it would be a bit caricatural to say that he just made decisions on everything. Um, he can, though, because he has final say on the board. I mean, he has, this, he has an overriding uh, shareholder's vote. He does, but there's something also, I think, is important to take into account, which is we saw a couple of years ago, you know, the uh, internal rebellion from um, Google's employees. And that's something big tech companies today are quite aware of, and they pay a lot of attention to how the decisions they make are being received by the employees and by the users. So I think it's a bit more balanced um, than it could have been. All right. So you're thinking it's more balanced because of uh, uh, they're, they're, the fact they're pure media players. Uh, let, let me ask you. In what way would, will threads be any different from Twitter? Is it the same? So once again, I'm not an expert on thread, but from what I see and what I observe, um, like the most important topic for me in terms of um, social networks is content moderation. And I do believe that we are talking about, the question is, do we want something that decentralized or diversity of actors on this part? And if you want a diversity of small actors, I mean, I agree with that. We need more diversity, but in the same time, if it's just small actors, I don't think they would be accountable enough because they don't have the incentives. They're too small to be efficiently regulated and uh, they don't have the resources to deploy. If you want to moderate interactions in a nice way, it, re it requires a lot of resources and I don't think they have it. So my answer would be, I think in terms of content moderation, it would be much more serious, at least on this part. That's what we've seen at Twitter. Uh, both companies uh, uh, are, well, bo both uh, tech leaders there are uh, making a lot of money these days. Uh, uh, Europe's top court on Tuesday, though, siding with Germany against Facebook's parent company, the Luxembourg-based EU Court of Justice, following regulators' order uh, that uh, Meta stop harvesting users' data without their consent, a decision that's been hailed on this side of the Rhine by the head of France's competition uh, uh, authority. He put out a tweet on Tuesday uh, where he called it a landmark decision. Uh, and and th this decision means one of the follow-ups on, on all of this, Leila Morch, is that uh, uh, Threads uh, is not yet uh, available on app stores inside the European Union. First, they're going to the U.S. and the U.K., uh, they're testing the waters, regulatory-wise, and just invented a word, uh, <laughs> regulation-wise. Well, I wouldn't say they're testing the water. I, it, I just seems that they're good, they're aware that regulation is coming and that they need time to understand the depth of the regulation and how it's going to impact uh, tools and, and platform they're building. So rather than testing the water, they just are aware that they need to take time to understand how the regulation is going to impact them. Uh, I think it's 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 pretty pretty good signal. I mean, what's... What the price of waiting a few more weeks or months if it uh, lets European people and, and citizens see how the app is deployed, what are the first cases, and how when it's 
deployed in Europe, um, it's going to be more mature in a way, maybe just by a few weeks, but it could already uh, be more uh, designed so it can protect uh, better citizens. On the other hand, though, uh, it means that at the beginning, other people in the world will be exposed to, to, to the potential um, harms that threats could, could pose. And, but the question is not just about the harms. It's, the question is much broader than just will there be online hate speech or not. You know, social media raises much more questions than just online hate speech. I want to get back to, to, to that point, but uh, Hubert Etienne, just a, br a brief word on this. First of all, Tuesday's ruling, obviously Facebook and, and, it, and, and has been, and Meta has been in the, the crosshairs of regulators on both sides of the Atlantic for a while now because of the fact that they're so preponderant with Facebook, even though it's only used by old people like myself. Uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, that's a lot for one company. Come on, you're not that old. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm the right person to decide if it's a lot or not, not enough. But um, there is a case in the U.S. and uh, the experts will we stayed on this. But just I just want to. But say if that there's a fourth, if there's a fourth company that comes in, in into its own, if Threads does work, this microblogging site, uh, does that precipitate regulators pushing for a breakup of Meta? We'll see. And once again, I totally get your point, and that's a legitimate question, but I'm on the other side, I'm also worried about small actors. And that's what we said a couple of years ago, remember, and then um, Donald Trump said, I'm going to launch Parley. Is it a good social network? I'll leave it to you to decide on this, but sometimes alternatives are worse than what we had before. So if we had good alternative, why not? I mean, everyone is for competition, and this is a free trade market, but uh, I would just be cautious on the emergence of like new actors who don't have the resources and the experience and perhaps the same tight scrutiny from regulators. The fact that uh, the European regulators are right now at the fore, how much are they at the fore? What do you, what do you, what do you mean? When it comes to trying to regulate so, uh, social media. Oh, how far have they been on the way of getting the thing done? Well, they will never get it done. Like regulation is always catching up. This is the issue. Regulation is always trying to regulate something that has been deployed and happening for how many years? So um, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a question, and this is going to go to the third point: How can we build better, better social media? But regulation is is trying to catch up, and so far, um, they are always trying to design regulation for social media the way they were uh, five, six, seven years ago. And so they're always, they're always catching up. J Jacob and Shingama, your thoughts on Europe's attempts uh, to uh, uh, moderate uh, uh, social media? Yeah, so I'm more of an expert on, on free speech than, than, than privacy, and I'm actually more worried about uh, so the Digital Services Act's impact on on free speech than than than, than privacy. I think um, Europe has a better case when it comes to to privacy concerns than the potential negative uh, consequences for free speech uh, of the DSA, uh, where of course there's a there's a big clash between how Europe and the US uh, defines uh, uh, free speech, and you have seen very aggressive comments by uh, EU Commissioner Thierry Breton, for instance, about uh, ab about how uh, big tech companies have to crack down on all kinds of speech, including potentially lawful uh, speech. Hubert Etienne, uh, yeah, it's, uh, ethics is your, is your remit. Data protection, privacy versus free speech, is that what it boils down to here? I mean, that's a big question that we've had for a long time, and it's not an easy one to address. And I totally agree with the point that was just made um, on the fact that free speech doesn't mean the same thing in Europe, especially in France and in the U.S. And that's what we would call in philosophy license, the way the U.S. understand it. But just to react to the point you were making before on, like, why is it not uh, in, in Europe yet? And I think um, I agree with Leila on the fact that that's how innovation is made today. If you look at open AI... Everybody follow the same process, which is you start with fish fooding, dog fooding, beta testing, and then you enlarge and iterate on the products. And I think that's actually what I see as a, as a strategy here. And I think it's quite wise, actually, because then you can test the product on a given population that you know pretty well, and then you can extend it safe, 
safely <laughs> or relatively safely, uh, and then implement feedback loops in order to iterate on a product as it grows. And you, you're, you're illustrating that Meta is a company that's based on just this, this whole world, whereas Elon Musk sweeps in uh, coming from selling uh, electric vehicles and uh, the Starlink and, and, and doing other things. Uh, you need, uh, you're making the point there that uh, basically you make it sound like Meta is, is going to roll over Twitter. I'm not sure I said that. Um, I guess the point I was trying to make is that I think the lessons have been learned and the way innovation is being made today at Meta, but also for Google, OpenAI and all the other companies here um, are getting pretty much similar. And as a European, we're, we're kind of watching this from the sidelines. It's a battle that's taking place in California. I mean, we have French people and European people working at Meta and at Google, a lot of them especially in AI divisions in the U.S., so but we don't call we, us observers. We don't have any EU uh, social media champions, do we? We don't, but the regulation, I can tell you that the team I work with, um, it's around 100 people who are focusing only every single day on preparing, regula um, getting the company ready for regulation, for the DSA, for the DMA, for the AI acts, for all this regulation coming or already passed. So it's a lot of people here and... What I can see, at least, is that the European regulation is having a huge impact on the rest of the world, not only in the, in the EU. And, and if, I, if I may say, um, indeed, we don't have huge uh, social media competitors uh, in Europe. Uh, we don't have the same ecosystem as well. We don't have the same actors. We don't have, we have talents, different talents. We don't have the same way to just raise a lot of money. We can say that for AI. L look, at, look at Mistral. They raise 100 million. That, that's a lot. They got a billion in the US. So there is also this, those question, uh, financial question. But in Europe, we definitely have a different set of values. We have a different vision of freedom of expression. And, and we have very promising, at least, beta testing company that could inspire the bigger ones. It's not only about building a company that's going to compete uh, with the big players. It's also to building small company that could, I don't know, just give a new light of how we can make social media and inspire the bigger company. And I can, I can quote republic.io, you know, there are French people trying to, to imagine a better social media from the governance to the tech to the way there will be color moderation and everything is, is new about this. They're small, but if we were to give them more space to speak out, maybe they won't make billions, but they could spread the world that something different is possible. And that's why Europe should be nurturing, not economical competitors, even if we could do that and we should do that, but also people that could just point out another way of doing that. Um, on the point of, of the privacy and, and, and the ethics, I think um, when we think and, um, about threads, the big difference with Twitter is Twitter took how many years to reach 250,000 uh, followers? Threads comes with a big database of Instagram, mm. but not only that, it comes with um, the advertising machine, in and out. Meta is the biggest player when it comes to advertising. They have all the networks, all the contacts. They know the entire ecosystem. This is what could make Shreds something powerful from day zero to day two. Just these big networks of an advertising machine in and out. And that would bring question about privacy because there is the probability... And draw that first scrutiny on, on if Facebook is too big, if Meta is too big, excuse me. You mean trying to, to break... Well... I don't think breaking anything will, 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 will make this better, you know? Like, we don't, create, we don't create value and hope by breaking something just because we don't know how, how to control it, you know? And if we break it, what, I mean, you know, there is the issue of you destroy another world, what's, what's coming next? And I'm, I, I'm, I'm aligned on that with Uber. Um, I'm not at all against raising small competitors. I think we need diversity, but we also need to think that it's not because we're going to, you know, like in the mythical thing, we cut one head and we have 10 others uh, popping up. Um, Meta, if we might look at the bright side, they have been regulated for how many years and they have links with the government. So in a way, it gives us more power to influence and lobby, which for me is really, really bad. But on the other hand, we have more access to them and we can still speak their language. We don't know what's going to happen when TikTok will be all over our social media or another kind of social media. So I think mm. it's super important to not just take down Facebook without a plan. You see what I mean? Like, I do think that 
having such a big actor is is bad. I do believe in decentralization. We could talk about Web3 and the future but of the But it's the, the devil you know versus the, versus the devil you, do, you, you, you don't know. Yeah. Again, we're, we're watching this from Europe, kind of on the sidelines. Uh, this challenge to a cage fight uh, between tech titans, uh, titans who, by the way, have gotten uh, s even richer since the start of the year, thanks to rising share prices. Uh, uh, the uh, Nasdaq index, uh, which is uh, tech in the United States, uh, means that it was up 39 percent since uh, January, uh, driven mostly by uh, uh, AI fever and big tech stocks, which translates into more money for uh, Elon Musk and Mark uh, uh, Zuckerberg. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, e Elon Musk, who has earned his net worth, his personal net worth has increased by 96 billion. I'm talking billions of dollars. Jacob uh, in Shingama, when you read 96 billion, he's, his net worth has increased by since the start of the year. Compare that to the 44 billion he claimed, which seemed astronomical to us uh, for Twitter. And um, it just seems like, uh, well, it's not that much money for Twitter after all when you're that rich. So uh, again, it's, it, it's, sort of bar, uh, it, it's sort of mind defying how much money these, these men have the, at their disposal. Yeah, to be fair, I don't think uh, Twitter has contributed to Elon Musk's uh, wealth. Uh, quite, quite, quite the 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 opposite. But I think you know, look, this this raises two uh, issues. Um, so before I, 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 we had technical issues, uh, transatlantic uh, disruptions. Um, my my point was that the Digital Services Act and and, and the DSA, um, there's a clash there between U.S. and and European values on on free speech, for instance, but. The DSA and, and European regulation, out of good intention, can actually also have bad consequences around uh, the world. So, when the Nets DG was was adopted by Germany back in 2017, my organization did a study where we we saw that countries like like Russia, like Venezuela, like Belarus, sort of copy pasted the the, the German law and sort of. Um, instituted uh, online censorship of social media platforms and then said, well, if Europe can do it, why can't we? And we're seeing some of the same things now uh, with the DSA. And one thing that is also often left out of this uh, conversation, we, we tend to focus on all the bad things um, that slip through the net, but, but there are actually quite a few studies, including some by my organ own organization, that shows that uh, the vast majority of things that are being removed is legal content. We're actually coming out with a, with a report very soon where we looked at the, the hate speech policies of eight major platforms since their inception, and we, we document that the policies against hate speech now go far beyond what is required under international human rights law, even though most of these platforms have actually signed up to live to, to, to respect international human rights law. So government pressure is one problem. But on the other hand, it's obviously also... But, but hang on, Jacob, there, you, you, you say that, but uh, we've noticed the uptick in vitriol on platforms uh, like uh, Twitter, uh, and a lot of it is... Uh, a hate speech or dog whistle messages that r strongly resemble it. But again, vitriol, that's not uh, something that would be prohibited under international uh, human rights uh, law. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and this is another problem. So European standards on free speech are actually less speech protective than the standards that uh, are under the UN, for instance. And so should, should, should lower, should standards that provide less protection for free speech be, um, you know, conform to, to European regional standards, knowing full well that these may actually end up hurting minorities in authoritarian states uh, because big tech platforms have a strong incentive to comply with European laws, both because of the size of the European market but also because the regulatory powers of the EU are so strong and that, you know, it sends a, a, a good signal for these platforms to say, well, you know, we're going to conform to European standards because it's a block of democracies and then, you know, it's, it's dip, more difficult to, to criticize it. But I'm, so what I'm saying is that this has a lot of downstream effects and you will actually see a lot of people, you know, in, in you know, dissidents and others in authoritarian states who are worried about uh, this uh, development. All right. How do you, on the one hand, uh, 
uh, defend free speech. On the other hand, stop disinformation. For France 24's focus segment, our India Bureau spoke with groups uh, who are fighting the uphill fight to expose disinformation. Yeah. Well, first of all, you're never going to get completely rid of uh, disinformation. Disinformation was, is not a, a new thing. It, it Sorry, was also just part of one second, Jacob. Let's see a little clip from that seg from that segment. Most Indians access their news on their mobiles, where they're met with a barrage of fake news. In Mumbai, the editorial staff of Boom Live is on a mission to flush out the sea of inaccurate and biased information. Govind Atiraj is the founder. Hi, I'm all uh, going to show them a video or story that we cracked recently. Yes, this, for example, is information that has gone viral on WhatsApp, that the editor of the New York Times praised Prime Minister Modi. After investigating, we found out that it was totally fabricated. One application in particular has become India's disinformation hub, WhatsApp instant messaging. In India, the smartphone equals internet equals WhatsApp. It's scary because, as we know, WhatsApp is an end-to-end -end encrypted platform. You know, no, if I send you something or we share in a group, no one else can see what's going on. Uh, what is the kind of misinformation that's spreading, the velocity at which it's spreading, and the damage that it's doing? According to an international audit firm, the number of smartphone users in India is expected to reach 1 billion by 2026. Ibaratian, this was the big concern, WhatsApp, during the last election cycle in India. Uh, Narendra Modi's up for re-election next year, and it's still the big concern. What's changed? Um, <clears throat> just to react on, on the points about enter and encryption, um, personally, I think it's a great thing, but I see all the tensions you may have here, and it's always the same tension between free speech and safety, between uh, privacy and... Um, and the possibility also for governments to exercise some surveillance on, on citizens. And I remember when it was, I think, three, four years ago when we started working on this, we expected people to be quite happy with that and to run encryption. Finally, you have like very safe uh, interactions that belongs to you and nobody can access. And the people who were raising alarms at that time were um, um, the Australian government and the US government because they couldn't access anymore the back doors they used to have to operate some surveillance on, on specific people. So here again, it's a philosophical question, uh, but I'm personally... But I if they need to do surveillance, they go see a judge and get a warrant. I would say, so I'm not an enough of an expert to mm. answer this question, uh, but from what I understood, it was not always the case in, in the past. But once again, I'm not an expert on the question, so this is only my understanding of the situation. Leila, Leila March. Yeah, I think on that side, and it's kind of like the global theme of this entire discussion. Um, to a certain extent, it's not really a discussion about social media. It's a discussion about what are the rules that govern your society. You see what I mean? Like, I think what Uber is pointing out is safety versus, you know, like privacy versus um, having something free or paying for that. And if you have those two questions, is it for everyone or is it for an elite? Okay, but let's bring it back then to the, the, to the question that we wanted to pose at the beginning. How do you build a better microblogging site, exactly. a better Twitter? Exactly. This is where, I mean, for me, this is a core question. How do you do that? Um, for me, there is, I would say, I'm going to make a list of kind of like the things we should change or think about. The first is engagement. How do we engage people on the platform? And we need for me to redesign absolutely what we think behind engagement. I could come back on that topic, but for me... Engagement I, means how you solicit people to react yeah, to your post. Exactly. And, and what's your model to keep them on the platform and, and all of that. And I think if we don't redesign that, we could like drive humanity to a complete disaster. Then we have the question of the economical model. We have the question of the regulation, the question of the governance of the platform, which is for me one of the most important one. We have the new challenges that are going to raise identity with generated AI and how can we prove people are actually real human. We're going to have traceability of the messages. We have the centralization of the decision making process. Then we have the question of the impact on society. We have the question of the privacy. We have the question of activation empowerment. And I would like to finish by this one, because how do you design a social media that's better by thinking long term? And this is for me where social media didn't do a great job, where regulation 
education is not doing a great job. And this is the thing with DSA. I mean, of course, it's good that they started to think about those kind of regulation, but on the long this term... This is the US what? regulation. Yeah, exactly. No, no, DSA is the European Union. DSA, European, excuse me, the European. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the impact on the long term of removing bad content and, and trying to take down this information? Of course, we need to do that. But at the end of the road, we don't remove bad content from the real world. You know, it's, it's, it's still cosmetic. It's important because online is deforming reality, but it's still cosmetic. So at the end of the road, the question is the empowerment of the users. And social media, better social media, should be more designed to activate the user rather than making him a spectator of what he receives. And today, social media are all about pushing, pushing, pushing content to people. They're not about making them pulling specific content. And this is how it's designed, because this is the economical model, this is the attention economy, this is all of that. For me, designing new social media is how do we want the human species as a society to evolve? How do we want to use the bias of the brain to make more money? Or do we want to take into account the bias of the brain to make society you know, better? And this is a huge question and not an easy one. But if we don't go in that direction, it will be cosmetic, short term, and we will be facing raising and bigger challenges with time going. Uh, Jacob and Shingama, all social media, and we can list all those that are known, there's a lot of them. Uh, they have the same business model, which is they want to keep you in front of their screen for as long as possible. What you're hearing there from Leila is, a, is uh, calling that into question. Do you agree? I think there are definitely um, things to, you know, I'd like to see much more experiment, uh, experimentation on the business model size. But I think we also need to understand that you know, human psychology uh, comes into play here. So it's it basically, it's it's at scale the same as, you know, if you are a tabloid newspaper, you choose the most, um, the, the most uh, alarmist headline, and that is likely to get uh, more people to subscribe or buy your newspaper than, uh, than a more boring one. Or if you're a France, uh, France 24, you maybe choose the most uh, dramatic pictures uh, as a hook rather than, than than something more 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 boring so that is not a new phenomenon but but it, at scale it's obviously something that where where we see ramifications that we hadn't thought through so i think it's it's important to experiment on 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 the uh, on, on on the business and and design side but i just want to warn again that i don't think we're likely to get sort of uh, a agreement on this. And we mentioned Ind India as an example where, where fake news is running rampant. And then one, one, one answer is to say, well, the government should, uh, should regulate this. But, um, but, but unfortunately, India is a, even though it's the world's largest democracy, it's also one that is increasingly cracking down on free speech, not only online, but also for journalists. And it is increasingly putting pressure on the platform to remove content that is perfectly legal but that uh, that it does not like, and it uses uh, you know disinformation, hate speech, and so on as excuses to try and limit. Those, so, so uh, Jacob, is there uh, a way to build a microblogging site that is I think, more effective? I think, I think that some of the things that we need to work on is trust. I think you know polarization, hate speech, and disinformation are much more likely to have uh, to, to be attractive to gain traction go, go viral when there's a low degree of trust. Uh, so we, for instance, uh, are experiencing with toolkits that will empower users to counter hate speech, for instance, rather than rely on governments or centralized platforms. The same with, uh, with, with, the same, uh, with uh, disinformation. So if we can um, foster intellectual humility into a, to a larger degree among users so that they are less likely to fall for disinformation and less likely to, to, to share it. I think that is a, an organic bottom-up approach that is much more promising than governments uh, adopting sort of sweeping laws and, and putting a lot of power on big centralized tech platforms um, with massive collateral damage for people around the world. But I don't think there's a perfect solution, and, and I think we have to get used to that. Hubert Etienne, these tech giants, they're not charities. They're trying to make money. Uh, is uh, a platform built on trying to build trust, is that a money maker? So, <clears throat> first, I couldn't agree more with has been, what has been said by Jacob on trust and also on the comparison between the real question is the attention economy. That's what we live in. That's what we sell at Meta. That's what YouTubers sell. That's what you sell. That's what newspapers sell. That's what everyone sells. 
And the question is, do we, can we change that? Because I'm happy as an ethicist to change the whole platform to direct it entirely to ethics and pacify the world with a lot of nudges. And if I were, uh, if it was my, my choice, I would do that. And probably what would happen first, it would be a disaster. Because you try to nudge people because you think you're doing the right thing, but we're not God. So no, you do something bad in the end. Second point, the company would probably go bankrupt by in two or three months. So we need to find something that is acceptable for people. And we also need to be humble, I think, to know that we don't know exactly what people want. Many things have been tried to say, how do we govern misinformation? How do we inform people about this? And many times um, we thought we had good ideas and users didn't like it. Because when you try to educate them, if I may say, or just like show them different kind of contents, they react badly to that and say, yes, but that's not what I expect. So what works, fear and loathing? Pardon? What works, fear and loathing? Um, I don't know. We're still trying to find the best way. But like, to, as far as I'm concerned, I think that the way we manage, we handle misinformation today, or like the process we had and the loop we have for that is quite major. And I kind of agree with that because it's not an easy, easy one to implement. But I think, you know, with like the... Uh, just informing people, cautious, uh, this piece of content has been reviewed and was found to be misinformation, or these might be graphic content, but people can still access it. I think this is um, quite a good compromise. Leila Marsh? Yeah, I think I, mean, I, I think I agree on that. We, we shouldn't take down um, all of that content because people have to face also like what people are posting. Just have way to be aware and have labels. And, and this is why uh, implementing not only community-driven content moderation because it, it doesn't work, but just some of that and help people engage a discussion on those kind of things with labels and people and kind of trusted flaggers, you know, but having that on a bigger scale could be interesting. On the other hand, it, it would be interesting to stop focusing only on the content, but on the behavior the content is showing. And for me, this is the main point. We shouldn't be saying, you cannot say that, you cannot say that this way, you cannot have insults, you cannot, but at the end, everything should be able to, to be debated, aside from, of course, you know, like the big ones. But we, if, if we start saying, oh, those topic of discussion cannot be discussed because it's too sensitive or because those people could be offended, then at the end of the day, everybody will be offended. On one hand, that's the case. On the other hand, we cannot let people have, you know, like rage storm and shit storm the way it happens. But this is behavioral, you know? So there could be a way of shifting uh, what we focus on. Um, on the other hand, and I do agree with Jacob, the question of trust, for me, the question of identity is, is, is going to be huge. How, and it goes with trust, how can, can I make sure that the content I receive is from a human being or hasn't been churned, those kind of things are going to become bigger and bigger. Um, and at the end of the day, it's a kind of trend of pushing and pulling, making the, the user more active. And, and as you say, we don't know what people want, but psychology has shown that the human species is, you know, like the brain is made to be just trying to optimize and do as little effort as possible. And the only way we managed to evolve as a species because we, we, we had to do that effort. And if people don't want to do effort, we cannot just say, okay, you're not gonna do anything because then what's the end of the road? You know, are we gonna be more and more passive users? You know, we cannot just do what people want because at the end of the day, all those buyers, all of the way we can get stuck in those loops of content. We, we have to think about a more balanced way and the long-term view of if I implement that, what's going to be the result in 10, 20, 40 years. All right, Leila Morch with a call for human beings to be active, not passive. That'll be the final word. Many thanks. Uh, uh, I want to thank as well uh, Hubert Etienne, uh, Jacob and Shingama for being uh, with us from Nashville. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24. Thank you. Merci.